good morning, and thank you for coming this morning and playing those instruments. That was wonderful. It's a small but happy crew that we have here today. Uh, I just have a couple of questions for you today. Well, first of all, you know what today is, right? Thanksgiving, exactly. What I'd like you to think about this morning is who are some of the people in your life that help you or protect you or teach you or keep you going? So just uh, name a few. My mom and dad. Mom and dad, sure. My friends. Friends, sure. Who else? Anyone else? Teachers, yeah. Who else? Well, I think we've got a pretty good list. You're right. There are a lot of people in our world who help us out. And what would what would you think if you forgot about them? Like, what would they? How would they feel if you didn't say thank you to them or you sort of just ignored them? Anyone? Katrina? Bad. They probably would feel bad. So, what would you do to make them feel better? Yep. Oh, wait a minute. Over there. Wait a minute. I need a little help here to get up. Um, say thanks. To them. That's it exactly. People who help us, they like to hear that they are being acknowledged and know that that uh, they're appreciated for the help that they give. So this Thanksgiving, I'd like us to think about that. Think about the people who help you. Think about the people in your life who um, make a difference with you, and take the time to say thank you. God's like that, too, and that's why part of the reason we come to church on Thanksgiving is to say thank you, God, for all the wonderful ways that you take care of us and for the people that you provide in our lives. What a glorious day and a sunny day to boot. Good morning and a happy Thanksgiving to everyone. We're delighted that you could be here with us this morning, and in the keeping of the spirit of thanksgiving. We're grateful to Pat, Clive, and this marvelous choir for their wonderful gift of music, music which inspires and uh, provides us with comfort and joy and a healing spirit. Our first reading this morning comes from Exodus, chapter 32, verses 1 to 14, where Moses pleads with God to save his people, the people of Israel, after they worship a golden statue of a bull calf. When the people saw that Moses had not come down from the mountain, but was staying there a long time, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, We do not know what has happened to this man, Moses, who led us out of Egypt. Make us a god, a god who will lead us. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold earrings which your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their gold earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took the earrings, melted them, poured the gold into a mold, and made a gold statue of a bull calf. The people shouted, Israel, this, this is our God who took us out of Egypt. Then Aaron built an altar in front of the gold bull and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to honor the Lord. Early the next morning, they brought some animals to burn as sacrifices and others to eat as fellowship offerings. The people sat down to a feast, which turned into an orgy of drinking and sex. The Lord said to Moses, Hurry and go back down, because your people, whom you led out of Egypt, have sinned and rejected me. They have already left the way that I have commanded them to follow. They have made a bull calf out of melted gold and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it. They are saying that this, this is their God who led them out of Egypt. Oh, I know how stubborn these people are. Now don't try to stop me. I'm angry with them, and I'm going to destroy them. Then I will make you and your descendants into a great nation. But Moses pleaded with the, with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why should you be so angry with your people, whom you rescued from Egypt with great might and power? 
Why should the Egyptians be able to say that you led your people out of Egypt, planning to kill them in the mountains and destroy them completely? Stop being so angry. Change your mind and do not bring this disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember the solemn promise you made to them to give them as many descendants as there are stars in the sky and to give their descendants all that land you promised would be in their possession forever. So the Lord changed his mind and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Our second reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 to 14, where Matthew gives his account of the parable of the wedding feast. Jesus again used parables in talking to the people. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. He sent his servants to tell the invited guests to come to the feast, but they did not want to come. So he sent out other servants with this message for the guests. My feast is ready now. My steers and prize calves have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. However, the invited guests paid no attention and went about their business. One went to his farm, another to his store while others grabbed the servants, beat them, and killed them. The king was very angry, so he sent his soldiers who killed those murderers and burned down their city. Then he called his servants and said to them, My wedding feast is ready, but the people I invited did not deserve it. Now go to the main streets and invite to the feast as many people as you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, good and bad alike, and the wedding hall was filled with people. The king went in to look at the guests and saw a man who was not wearing wedding, wedding clothes. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The king asked him. The man said nothing. Then the king told his servants, Tie him up hand and foot and throw him outside in the dark. There he will cry and gnash his teeth. And Jesus concluded his story with this observation. Many are invited, but few are chosen. May God bless these passages to our understanding. Amen. I'd like to uh, talk to you about, you notice my sermon title today is called The Good Guest Guide. And uh, so what I'd like to do is just sort of pick your minds for a little bit about what it means to be a good guest. What does a good guest do? You go to visit someone in their home, perhaps, or you're invited to a dinner party, or you go to a wedding. So what what is the etiquette behind that? And etiquette has kind of become important in my house. Because I have a, you know, as you know, a two-year-old and a, well, she's four in two days. Um, and uh, going to school, one of them, and the other one's going to daycare, and they're starting to learn a bit about social skills, and, you know, we'll try and just teach them to say thank you and please and share and, uh, you know, so. So I'm going to sort of just talk about a few things now. So you're at a dinner party now. Uh, normally at a dinner party, what's one of the first things you do when you come into someone's home? Yeah, you say, you greet them, right. You, you say, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Um, you know, it's probably not a good idea just to storm by them and go into the house, right? I mean, that, you know, it's like, pick the best seat and sit down. <laughs> that, that would be it. No. So now you're at the you're at the dinner table and your your host or hostess has left to to get some more food and then has delayed a little bit and so you start a food fight. Is that correct? Is that probably probably that happens at my house, but probably not a good idea when you go out, right? And then at the end of the party, you uh, 
what do you do then? Like, at the end, it's time for everyone to go home, and, you know, what do you say? What do you, who do you talk to? You, you go to whoever hosted the party, right? And you say, thank you for having me. You might talk to the other guests and say, it's nice to see you. And, you know, if you like them, you might say, well, we'll, well, let's connect, you know, later. Or if you don't particularly like the other guests, you may just say, it was nice to see you and stop right there. But you do say goodbye. It's something we're teaching our girls right now, too. <laughs> You don't do like one of my daughters who just sort of storms out and forgets that whoever was there was there, <laughs> including grandparents. And we all know how grandparents feel about being said goodbye to, right? <laughs> it's a very important thing to get that kiss goodbye. Well, um, the stories we heard in the Bible today are kind of good guest guide stories gone wrong. In the first story we heard from Exodus, the people of Israel have been invited by their host God out into the desert to escape and experience freedom, to escape oppression in Egypt. And uh, the host of the party, Mr. Moses, disappears for a little while. And the guests get antsy, but rather than thank the host or look for the host, they just decide to create a new one. Just out of the blue, we'll just find someone else to thank. And so they create this golden calf, and they start to have basically what amounts to a huge adult food fight, is what it kind of becomes. And that is not a good thing. And so you can imagine why God got kind of miffed by the whole thing. I mean, how would you feel that having gone to the kitchen and you come back, not only has there been a food fight, but they don't even recognize you as the host anymore? No one's listening to you. They're just doing their own thing. Not good guests. In fact, you might call the police and just have them all removed. Now, God can do more than just call the police. God is the police, so. But Moses intervened on behalf of the people and reminded God of God's goodness and that God can overlook these things because God is God, after all. In the second story, it's a wedding party. And the same sort of thing happens. Rather than being thankful and welcoming the opportunity to go to the wedding banquet, people reject the wedding banquet invitation and kind of become very rude to their host. Now, if you were a king of the land, you'd think that it would be a good thing to go to these kind of events because you could network, and if you're in the good graces of the king, you might get some benefit out of it. So why on earth would you slap the king in the face and refuse his invitation and be ungrateful for it? It's all about being good guests to God, our good host. Well, these are both, these are examples of wedding guests who've gone wrong. What if the party itself is a bummer? (laughs) What happens if the party itself turns out to be the worst party you've ever been to in your entire life? There was a minister by the name of, uh, I'm going to check my notes because my brain isn't quite working. Um... Martin, yes, that's, I knew it was an N-word. His name was Pastor Martin, and he was um, the minister among four ministers in a small town that was kind of being overrun one way or the other by different warlords, depending on basically almost what time of year it was. His town was torn, constantly torn, by the different wars, and it was a frontline town, basically, I guess that's what you would call it. Because every time a new wave of marauders would come in, they would get the worst of it. But they were the only town in the area, and people would start coming to the town in order to flee from the other parts of the country where there was also these skirmishes and wars. To the point where the town became so overcrowded that there wasn't enough resources even to take care of them. In fact, it got so bad that one year, Pastor Martin performed 40 to 50 funerals a day because cholera and pestilences overtook the town. 
In that year, he performed 4,000 funerals. Can you imagine that? 4,000. Imagine the toll that would take on your soul, on your body. Bad enough, you know, your, your people are being killed by all these different uh, warlords that come through. But because you don't have the medical resources, people are dying in droves from diseases. In May of that same year, when he did 4,000 funerals, his own wife passed away. It got so bad that he had not... There were four ministers in that town, or five ministers, including him. Two of the ministers couldn't take it. They left. The other two ministers, he performed their funerals. He was the only one left in town. Now that is a bad party. That is something you don't even, can't even imagine. And yet we know it still happens around the world today. To make things worse, one of the warlords that sort of took over his town demanded that his people come up with $30,000 as a way of keeping the peace, as a kind of incentive, if you like. And he was at his wit's end. He didn't know what to do. He went to this warlord and he said, listen, you know, there's no money here. I don't even have enough to feed children. Children are going barefoot and starving in the streets. How am I supposed to come up with $30,000? The warlord could care less. All he wanted was his money. So Pastor Martin called his people together and said, you know what, we got to pray. That's all we can do. And so they gathered. They basically, I guess, in modern terms, they had the first prayer in. They all got on their knees in front of the palace of this warlord. And Pastor Martin led them in a prayer. The warlord was so moved by the prayer, and perhaps when he looked around and saw how poor everyone really was, he capitulated. But you know what? He didn't go as far as to say, oh, well, you know, don't worry about it. He says, you still have to come up with $2,000. And so Pastor Martin basically sold everything he had in order to pay for his people the $2,000. Now, you would think this kind of person would be completely heartbroken by this, for sure, but disillusioned by the whole thing. I think most of us would have given up. We said, you know what, there is no hope here. There's no no way any good can come of this. Why try? Why bother? Well, we don't know much about what his thinking was, but... He must have really believed that there was another power undergirding his society, his world. A power that he could rely on. A power that could transform even the darkest hours. Otherwise, how could you go on? He must have believed that there was another way of life beyond this life in order to even perform 20 of 4,000 funerals. He must have believed that there was a possibility of a future. That someone else was in control, a higher power, higher than all these warlords that keep running through his town, decimating his people. Pastor Martin sat down and started thinking about things, and he actually came up with, he was a a poet of sorts, and so he wrote a little poem, a table grace, something that people could say at every meal, a very simple one. Little did he know that it was something that would transform the world, that 
would transform cultures. Now thank we all our God. With hearts, with hands, with voices. Who wondrous thing has done in whom this world rejoices. Who from our mother's arms has carried us on our way and blessed us with gifts of love that still are ours today. Pastor Martin's world wasn't so different from ours, even though it was over 400 years ago. And that song has become a sort of bastion for people throughout the ages. In fact, I don't know if you really could have a Thanksgiving service without singing it. As we sing this song, let that be our prayer and our reminder to give thanks and be good guests, because it kind of is a good guest guide, to thank God in spite of all our circumstances and for all our circumstances. To do as the choir reminded us, it's good to praise the Lord. Because Martin did see a change in the world. There would be many more wars in his country, but I believe it was, uh, let me just check, make sure I know we got the date right. We got In 1648, there was a peace treaty signed, and his people did see freedom for a while.